Well, it is such an honor to be joining all of you and to have this conversation. Today, I'm not giving an academic talk. I wanna share with you some of the most important lessons that I've learned as a family caregiver and a caregiving scientist. And hopefully these are lessons that you all have already learned or can take with you as you move forward on your caregiving journeys. So all of us in the room, we are caregivers. We were caregivers. We're gonna be caregivers again. This is a role that touches all of us. At least 53 million individuals in the United States today identify as a family caregiver. And it's a role that we enter and exit repeatedly throughout our lives and a role that deeply changes the trajectory for our life moving forward. Now, there are certain caregiving roles that we enter that are joyous, those of a parent and child. This picture was taken on November 4th of 1981, the day that my dad, became my dad, my caregiver. But of course, there are other caregiving roles that have a very different emotional tone. The care we provide for our parents and partners and children and siblings and friends who live with chronic and life-limiting illnesses and depend on us for care. This picture was taken 32 years later on November 4th of 2013, as I was my dad's primary caregiver. What these two pictures, and these two roles have in common is love. And that is what is at the heart of what it means to be a caregiver. As a caregiver, we give of ourselves physically, emotionally, spiritually, existentially, and financially. We do so without financial compensation and too frequently without training, education, and support. And what we give of ourselves is care, is love. Now, before I speak any further about caregiving, I wanna tell you a little bit about my dad, Stan Applebaum. My dad was born in 1922, and he had initial aspirations to become a surgeon. But when he was seven years old, he fell out of a tree and broke his pinky finger. And the, and the doctor who took care of him said that in order to rehabilitation, rehabilitate that finger, he should tap that finger on the player piano my grandparents had at home. Little did that doctor know that his prescription would lead to a musical career that would span nearly a century. My dad was drafted into World War II, but it was actually music that saved his life. He was on the front lines in Wiesbaden, in Germany, but he was able to convince the commanding officer that he could better use his pianist fingers as a teletypist and convey important communications to Washington as opposed to holding a gun. And so he got off the front lines, was put in the special services, and eventually back home to safety. He used the GI Bill to study music and composition. And by the time he was 30 years old, he was one of the most sought after composers and arrangers in New York City. And by the time he was 40, he was writing hit arrangements for all the big artists of the 50s and 60s, including Benny King and Neil Sedaka, Connie Francis, and Brian Hyland. Now, all of you may not have been born at the time that this song was written, I'm not sure, but my guess is that everyone in this room has heard this song before. Dad had a hand in every aspect of Benny King's Stand By Me, but what turned that song from a piece of music to a piece of art was the string line in the middle, which, which was my father's. That was his composition. So you've already met Stan Applebaum. My dad's life was a life of music, but much more broadly, it was a life of creativity. And what that meant is that he never wanted to stop learning and growing. And when he was confined to a hospital bed during the last years and months of his life, that held. He was not done living, learning, and growing. That meant he continued to compose music in his mind and have others write it down. And he even chose at age 95 to learn Tagalog, the native language of his home health aides. He never wanted to stop growing. And it was my job as a caregiver to make sure that every one of his healthcare professionals taking care of him understood that about him. Now, my dad was an incredibly masterful musician. But much more importantly to me, he was an incredibly talented father. He was exquisitely supportive. He modeled for me emotional vulnerability. And around him, I felt safe, I felt loved, and I felt expansive. All right, I'm gonna turn back to caregiving now. 
So in 2010, I joined the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center as a postdoctoral fellow. And that year, I began to see patients with advanced life-limiting cancers in my clinical practice. And what was so striking to me about these sessions was as opposed to patients emphasizing their concerns about their own mortality, the focus instead was on their parents and partners and children and siblings and friends. The individuals left in the waiting rooms, the individuals left at home, the individuals who they identified as the linchpin of their care and the individuals who would be most deeply impacted by their eventual deaths. I realized at that time that cancer care was increasingly relying on family caregivers and yet was not necessarily providing them with the training and support they needed to carry out their responsibilities. And I also realized that there were no support services available for caregivers in any cancer center in the country, despite the fact that at that time there was already a large body of literature documenting this, the distress that we as caregivers experience. And so a year later in 2011, I founded the Caregivers Clinic at MSK, whose mission is to assure that no caregiver go experiencing significant distress as a result of their role goes unidentified and deprived of necessary psychosocial care. The same year that I began the clinic, my own caregiving journey began. My dad had lived to his late 80s with really no major medical issues. In the winter of 2011, he had a car accident. He actually walked away from the accident, thank God, but it turns out he was going into heart failure while driving down the New Jersey Turnpike. I was the one to receive that phone call. I was identified at that moment as the caregiver. About a year and a half later, I took him to the hospital for treatment of UTI, and UTIs were the primary drivers of our, of our trips to the ERs, as they are for many older adults. And my dad experienced delirium, which is a confused or altered mental state, also common in older, result, older adults. And this time he was given an antipsychotic medication without my consent or my mother's consent at the time she was still alive and she was his healthcare proxy. And this antipsychotic medication, it put him into a coma. And he was in this state for about two weeks. And during this time, it became so very clear to me that without me by his side, there was no way for any members of the healthcare team to have any idea who Stan Applebaum was and what mattered to him. Without me serving as his eyes, ears, and voice, they would have no idea that this was a man committed to continuing to live and to grow. This is the first, first lesson I wanna share, that you are responsible for preserving the identity of your care partner, for telling their story, or helping them to tell their story. Now, soon after this coma, my dad was diagnosed with Lewy body disease which is a progressive neurodegenerative disease that leads to fluctuations in autonomic functioning and consciousness, which in my dad meant he would have sudden drops in blood pressure or temperature to near hypothermia levels, or he would hallucinate. He would hallucinate for a few minutes, sometimes a few hours, occasionally up to a day, and one point up to a week. And we never knew how long the hallucinations would last. So of course I got a crash course in telling a story. But regardless of whether your partner in care lives with a neurodegenerative disease or not, you are still going to be tasked with telling their story. Now, in the first chapter of my book, Stand By Me, I have a list of information that you all should have in your back pocket. My guess is you already do. I'm not going to read through this. This is all you need to know when you bring someone to the emergency room so you can effectively convey who they are and why they're there. But I want to say that just as important as everything on this list is your capacity to convey to the healthcare team who your care partner is and what matters to them. Not just their goals of care, but their goals of life. Had I not done that, had I not conveyed that to members of the healthcare team, my dad would have never survived this period in 2013. And he would have never gone on to live at least five and a half more years of life, which he recovered and he enjoyed beautiful moments in the sunshine with one of his favorite drinks. Now, during this time, I learned the second lesson I want to share with you that you are likely already familiar with, but I like to drink, bring elephants into the room, which is that you are a member of the healthcare team. We all don't have white coats on. We all don't have pagers in this Zoom room, but we all are healthcare team members. And another elephant, we are the long-term care system in this country. Our healthcare system cannot function without us. 
And as a member of the healthcare team, you are the missing link between patients and healthcare professionals. You are brokering information. You are the hub of an info flow wheel that cannot turn without you. And in this role, your responsibilities are vast. And I wanna highlight three domains that oftentimes come as, come as a surprise to caregivers who come to our clinic at MSK. These include medical and nursing tasks, case management, and healthcare communication. Now, we all are asked to perform medical and nursing tasks. And in a startlingly way, we're asked to do so without training. In fact, we are increasingly asked to do things that once only physicians and nurses and advanced practice providers were doing. For me, it was no question that I was gonna take my dad's vital signs. I was gonna take care of his super pubic catheter. I was gonna give him injectable medications. I was gonna clean him, his bed sore. I was gonna care for wounds. I never got training to do any of this. My guess is many of you have had a similar experience. Now, I wanna point your attention to current public policy. This is not a policy talk per se. That could be another talk I do. Um, our public policy landscape is certainly failing us in many ways, but there are a few policies that focus on caregivers. And one of them is called the Caregiver Advise, Record, Enable Act, the CARE Act. This is currently passed in 45 states and territories. You can see where it is, if it's in the state where you reside. And the CARE Act has three provisions. The third is what I want to point your attention to. Oops, I want to point your attention to. Um, it says that when a patient is going to get discharged from the hospital, that the hospital is required to provide that caregiver with training and education and instruction so that the caregiver knows how in the world to take care of them when they go home. But this does not consistently happen. It's not consistently implemented. So I want to give you a tip. If you're in a situation where your care partner is getting discharged and you have another skill you need to learn or that you're asked to perform, before you leave the hospital, I want you to ask a nurse or other member of the healthcare team to demonstrate for you what it is you're gonna to have to do at home. And then I want you to demonstrate for them, I want you to demonstrate it back to them. I want you to teach it back to them to make sure that you feel comfortable and competent and confident to do so at home. Similarly, many patients are prescribed visiting nurse visits when they get home from the hospital. We had that through the visiting nurse service of New York for about two weeks after every hospitalization. I want you to look at every nurse visit as an opportunity, not only for your care partner to get evaluated, but for you to brush up on your skills. Now, the second domain, case management. Case managers are by definition, paid employees of hospital systems and healthcare systems to, co to coordinate care. But we as family caregivers are case managers free of charge. And on that note, you're likely aware that at the end of 2023, According to the AARP, the efforts of caregivers such as everyone in this room accounted for $600 billion. $600 billion, despite the fact that one quarter of us experience high financial strain. These case management responsibilities oftentimes pile upon so many other things that you're doing, direct physical care, but they are nonetheless incredibly stressful. And oftentimes they mean that you spend a lot of time on the phone. You're going to be coordinating many members of the medical team, insurance reimbursement, home health care, making sure the home is safe, getting medications. For me, the most complicated aspect of my case management responsibilities was getting my dad onto Medicaid and implementing home care. In the seventh chapter of my book, I go into this process in detail to try to demystify the, this, the experience for those of you who might be interested in this have not yet started the process. If you're interested, it's a process I encourage you to start yesterday because wait times start at one year. Flip side, there can be many benefits to getting your care partner onto Medicaid. But just to say that this is a huge domain of responsibility added on to the physical and medical and nursing tasks we all perform. And then, of course, there's this other category of invisible responsibility. I say invisible because we don't often think of it as a responsibility but it's almost the bread and butter of what we do as family caregivers. And that is communication. We must engage in healthcare communication, both with our care partners and with members of the healthcare team. And throughout my book, I provide many tips and tools to help you navigate conversations that can be overwhelming. And I wanna give two of them to you right now. The first is that many caregivers say to me that there are certain questions that they wanna ask the doctor but they are concerned that if they ask, 
they're going to upset their care partner, that their care partner doesn't want to know the answer. If you're in a situation like this, I encourage you to have what we call the consent conversation. The consent conversation is a conversation you have in advance of the appointment with the doctor where you ask your care partner's permission. You get their consent to bring up a certain topic. So for example, with my dad, it sounded something like this. Dad, I would really like to ask your doctor what treatments are available if this treatment stops working. Would that be okay? And if my dad said no, I would say, well, okay, can I ask? I'm going to ask you again next month before our next appointment. Now, there's one situation where this might be particularly important, and that is if you as a caregiver are concerned that your care partner is not engaging in healthy behaviors, such as not eating healthfully, drinking too much alcohol, smoking, very importantly, not be, being adherent to medications. If you're concerned about their health-related behaviors, you may be in a situation where they might not be reporting that to their doctors. Again and again, patients oftentimes sugarcoat how they're actually doing, right? We as caregivers, we're on the front lines. We see reality, but reality is not always reported to the doctors. So in this situation, I encourage you to have a consent conversation. It might sound something like this. Babe, I'm concerned about how difficult you're finding it to remain adherent to your medications. I think it's important your doctor knows you aren't taking them daily. Can we mention this to him next week? Getting on the same page with your care partner way in advance of that meeting means that you're really gonna maximize the time you have. And we all know that these meetings with the doctors go really fast. We have high levels of the stress hormone cortisol. So we wanna be prepared. Now, healthcare communication is most critical as you assume the role of healthcare proxy. Many of us as family caregivers become a formal healthcare proxy. And the responsibility of a healthcare proxy is to bring our care partner's voice into the room, to convey what their wishes are if they are unable to do so on their own. In order to do that, we actually need to know what our care partner's goals are. And in order to know them, we need to ask them. But asking them invites an elephant into the room. And that elephant, is death. These conversations are some of the most difficult that we have as caregivers, even for those of us who for a career speak to others. This is hard. So I wanna give you a suggestion. I want you to do what we call setting the agenda. When you set the agenda, you put out on the table immediately what you wanna talk about and why. And you can practice setting the agenda multiple times before opening the conversation to ensure that you feel comfortable to do so. So setting the agenda might sound something like this. I know this is hard to talk about, but I would really like to discuss what type of treatment you would want in the future if we can no longer control your Lewy body disease. It's important for me to know what you want so that I can be sure to carry out your wishes if you can't tell the doctors what you want at that time. Can we talk about this? And just to say, all of this is in the book, no need to write down notes. I see some people scrambling. I want to emphasize that this is a conversation you're not going to have once or twice. This is a conversation that's going to be repeated because goals of care change. What my dad wanted for his care in 2013 was dramatically different from the care he wanted in 2019, the year he died. And had I not had these repeated conversations, there would have been no way for me to know what his goals of care were and no way for me to carry them out. And so these conversations will be repeated. Okay. Now, I know that bringing an elephant in the room and mentioning goals of care can be anxiety provoking. So I think this is a fantastic moment for me to teach you what is one of the most powerful and simple stress management techniques for caregivers. And that is the deep, deep, deep diaphragmatic breath. That is a deep breath in through your nose, held for three seconds. I can't speak and hold at the same time, but it's one, two, three, and then exhaled through your mouth. I want you all to breathe this way while I continue to speak. When we take a deep diaphragmatic breath, we get oxygen to our brain. That oxygen lowers our stress hormone cortisol. 
just one minute of deep diaphragmatic breathing can dramatically lower your anxiety. I encourage all of you to do this before any big conversation, before any medical appointment, any caregiving task that causes you anxiety. Now, anxiety is common, as are many other mental health concerns. This is why I'm a clinical psychologist devoting my career to addressing the mental health needs of family caregivers. We as family caregivers are at higher risk for anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder than the patients for whom we provide care. And without support, this distress we experience can increase exponentially. You all are likely familiar with the National Alliance for Caregiving. They conduct studies in this country every five years to canvas the state of caregiving. Their last data came out in 2020. It was pre-pandemic data though. Their next data set's coming out in 2025. I'll be very curious to see what it looks like. But even pre-pandemic, 21% of caregivers in this country, 21% of the 53 million said that their health was fair or poor. And 36% said they experienced high emotional stress. Not surprising, but very concerning. And I, as a psychologist, was not immune to any of this. This picture was taken just a few weeks before my dad died. I was feeling so burnt out. I was feeling so many of the things that my patients share with me. I was exhausted. I was lost. I felt powerless, depleted, and sad. I want to emphasize that every word on this screen is normal. In fact, as a psychologist, I get so much more concerned when I meet a caregiver and they say to me they're doing fine than when I meet a caregiver who says they're doing all of these things in this word bubble here, okay? I get much more concerned. We all know, we're all here for a reason. We all know that caregiving is hard. We experience difficult emotions. That's a fact. But what I want to point out to you, the third lesson today, is that emotions are messengers and they can teach us how to live more fully. And if we are stuck in a caregiving situation, most of us don't choose the situation, right? We're put into it and we're gonna experience negative emotions. Well, let's use these emotions. Let's capitalize on them to learn to live more fully. And I wanna illustrate this for you with three emotions that I hear in my clinical practice, often accompanied by judgment. The first emotion is anger. Everyone in this room is a caregiver. You have every right to be angry. You have every right to be angry that your life has been put on hold, that your dreams have been deferred, that you cannot plan for the next year, the next month, the next week, the next day, the next hour, a few minutes sometimes, right? It's maddening. That anger needs to come out. By that, I wanna make sure you hear me loud and clear, and I know this is getting recorded. I'm not telling you to go yell at your care partner. That's not what Dr. Applebaum's telling you to do. I am saying you should go yell into a pillow or close the car door and yell, or talk to a therapist or tell your best friend about how freaking upset you are about everything and how angry you are. That's really important. But I also want to highlight something about anger. It's rarely unidimensional. And I want to illustrate this with a woman I was working with in the past who was so angry at her husband. Her husband was had a, a non-small cell lung cancer. She was so angry because he could no longer take care of the home the way he once did. He could no longer travel the way they once did. They could no longer have sex because of his being so debilitated. Their life had completely changed and she was angry. But what came up in session when she was describing her anger and getting it out was that when she would look at her husband, when she would see this frail man, she was grieving for the man she had married. She was sad. For her, beneath anger, there was sadness. And that is usually the case. It is so much easier for us to feel anger than sadness. In fact, there's always a deep well of sadness somewhere behind fierce anger. So I wanna encourage each of you not only to get your anger out, but the next time you feel anger, I want you to ask yourself, what am I grieving? I'm not saying it has to be life or death. It could be grieving the loss of the ability to plan for your afternoon. What am I sad about? And can you connect with that sadness? And can you allow some of that emotion out? And if you can, my bet is that you're going to notice your anger is going to dissipate. The second emotion I want to highlight is disgust. Can't see all your faces, but let's be honest. Caregiving at times is disgusting, right? 
We do things that are disgusting. Changing the diapers of our adult parents, let's agree, it's disgusting. It's no fun. Changing a colostomy bag of a romantic partner, that, that's also disgusting. Changing bandages on a wound that is weeping and has a strong odor, also disgusting. What I often hear in my clinical practice, though, is judgment about the disgust. And I'm going to say I'm guilty of this. I wrote about this in the book. I had an experience where I was tasked with changing my dad's diaper. It was one of the most physically challenging things I've ever had to do. Just how in the world can I do this? My dad was six foot one and he was, he was full assist and it was very complicated. But I remember after it happened, I went into the living room and I was crying. And I was crying because I, I, I realized I, I was disgusted. And then I was angry at myself for feeling disgusted because I was saying to myself, Allison, how dare you? This man was in a coma last year and here he is in your bed. You should be so grateful. The only thing I did wrong that night was the judgment. What I wish I had done and later was able to accomplish through texting with a close friend was listen to what my best friend would have said to me, which is that was disgusting. And also you just did one of the most challenging aspects of caregiving. You're incredible. You are superhuman. I want to encourage everyone here. The next time you feel disgust, I want you to imagine what would your best friend say? Would they judge you for the disgust or would they say to you, oh my gosh, that was incredible. Use disgust as a motivator to pat yourself on the back. Now, I couldn't talk about emotions and caregiving without talking about guilt. I think we're great with guilt, right? Guilt is one of the most common words I hear in my clinical practice. And I know caregivers feel guilt when I hear the woulda, shoulda, couldas. I shouldn't be her, Dr. Applebaum. I should be at his bedside. I shouldn't be her, Dr. Ba Dr. Applebaum. I'm not the patient with cancer. When we do the woulda, shoulda, couldas, when we feel this guilt, we feel like we are about to let someone else down. We're about to let our care partner down. But actually, that's wrong. When we feel guilt, it's actually a red flag that the person that we are letting down or about to let down is ourself. Guilt is a beautiful, beautiful wrong way sign. It tells us we need to turn around. We need to go in the other direction and consider in what way can we better meet our own needs. I encourage each one of you as you move forward from this afternoon, anger, disgust, guilt, when they come up, see if you can work with them to experience a perhaps adjusted emotional experience. I also want to acknowledge that it's very important to know when to seek professional support. These emotions are normal and professional support is a good thing. And oftentimes I'll say to caregivers in my practice, I didn't begin this clinic because caregivers are all mentally ill. I began this practice because caregiving is one of the hardest things we do as humans. When should you seek professional support? If your emotions are so intense and debilitating that you can't take care of your care partner and you can't sleep at night, you can't carry forward your other responsibilities, that's a good sign to seek help. And in the 10th chapter of my book, I provide many resources and ways for you to reach out for help. I wanna go back to this picture for a minute. It actually had popped up on my phone. My dad died on February 23rd of 2019. So every February, I get all these memories, January, February from you know five years ago this time. And, Wish I could fix that, but um, I think we all we all face that in grief. Um, I bring this up because I was looking at this picture and I was thinking about why I took the picture. Yes, I was burnt out. Yes, I was depleted. Yes, I sensed that our time together was coming to an end. But I took it for another reason. And that is because in that moment, I was feeling so incredibly proud of myself proud that I had survived an ultra marathon of caregiving, proud that I was able to take care of my father in the midst of my mother's sudden death a year after that coma, proud that I got him onto Medicaid and I navigated our hellacious healthcare system, and proud that I was able to give him a quality of life that he deserved. And in that moment, I realized what is the fourth and perhaps the most important lesson, and that is that meaning and suffering can coexist. And I want to be very clear when I say this, it's not about turning lemons to lemonade or the power of positive thinking. It's that meaning and suffering, suffering can happen at the same time. 
And whenever I talk about this, I use what is my favorite dessert to describe this, which is the creme brulee. So for those of you who are not creme brulee aficionados, um, uh, when a creme brulee is, is done properly, it's very rarely done properly, but when it is, it's crispy on the outside and it's creamy on the inside and it's cold on the inside and it's hot on the outside. And you take that first bite and there's so much going on. So this is how I think about our experience as caregivers. At any one time, we can feel that sadness, that disgust, that anger, that guilt, that fear, as well as love, hope, strength, connection, the suffering and the meaning can coexist. And there are particular routes through which we can connect to meaning. It is always available to us. It is our job, our, I don't wanna say job. We have the opportunity at all times to connect to it. And here are some ways, by choosing your attitude, choosing how you face limitations and suffering and losses. I'm guessing most of you did not choose your caregiving role. Most of us as daughters were thrown into it, right? But we can choose how we respond. My dad taught this to me masterfully. When he was stuck in the hospital and he was feeling well, he used his time to his fullest. Okay, that hospital bed tray, it's a great place for the chessboard. And when he got home and he was too weak to get out of bed, he chose to do workouts the best that he could to get himself strong. Choosing his attitude meant setting a goal for the future. His goal was to walk down the boardwalk by the New Jersey shore within two years of arising from a coma. And he practiced walking in the hallway every day with our home health aid so that he could finally make it to the boardwalk and he walked with his walker on his own. That's attitude. Realizing how can we push ourselves to do something differently despite the limitations we face. The second route is reconnecting with your authentic sense of self. What makes you, you? Now, my guess is many of you who are caregivers might feel disconnected from yourself, perhaps because you can no longer do the things you once enjoyed, perhaps work full time, perhaps travel, but maybe you've become disconnected from what you felt made you, you. But the reality is that caregiving doesn't take away who we are at our core. It just doesn't. For my dad, he was always a musician and he was gonna stay a musician. And even when Ben bound in the last year of his life, he conducted, he never stopped. That's him reconnecting with his authentic self and self, sense of self. And doing so meant that that last year of life was meaningful for him. Same for me. I didn't go into it today. I had a first career as a ballet dancer. And when I was stuck in the hospital, his hospital bed made a great place for a ballet bar. Granted, it wasn't the same as having the freedom to go take a dance class, but to connect to my inner dancer helped me to feel strong. And sometimes even a smidge, smidge of happiness. And connecting to my authentic sense of self has carried me through grief. In fact, six months after his death, I got back on stage for the first time in 20 years with his cane and his hat and his shirt and I danced. And when I got off stage, I cried. It was a creme brulee moment. It was joy and it was grief. It was all of it at the same time. So I want you to consider what is your authentic sense of self? In the ninth chapter of my book, I ask pointed questions to help you to connect to your sense of self. I want you to answer those questions and consider how you can reconnect to that part of yourself, okay? And I want you to remember at the same time that you likely have all grown as a result of caregiving. You're meeting Allison 6.0. Allison 2.0 was the caregiver in 2013. I have grown and changed because of caregiving. It is inevitable. I have lost track of the number of caregivers who said to me they had no idea how strong they were until they became a caregiver. Or they found their voice because of caregiving because they've had to speak up with so many healthcare professionals. So I want you to consider in what ways you have grown. That is meaning. Another route to meaning is taking responsibility for your life. You all know this. We are responsible for our lives. No one else is going to do it for us. And this is particularly important when we feel like our life is no longer ours. So I wanna emphasize, you must redefine what self-care means to you. This is a phrase that gets thrown out, thrown around a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. For me, for many of my patients, self-care means anything you can do to preserve your energy. We as caregivers do not have a limitless supply of energy. We have to protect ourselves. And that means setting boundaries. I cut people out of my life. The people who didn't buoy me up, the people who drained my energy. I encourage you to think about how can you preserve your own energy? 
And taking responsibility means asking for help, which I know is very hard as a caregiver. We are so good at giving help. We are terrible at asking for help, but I want you to learn to do it and doing so is meaningful. And when you ask for help, I wanna encourage you to be as specific as possible because the more specific you are with your asks, the more likely your needs are gonna be met. And if offers of help come your way, say yes immediately. Even if you don't know what to say, you could say yes, and I'll tell you what I need when I think of it, okay? And I wanna encourage you to lean on others, to delegate. I talk a lot in the book about this. There was no way that I could have taken care of my dad without the team of home health aides. This picture was taken on March 1st of 2019, the day that would have been my dad's 97th birthday, a few days after his funeral. And I was thinking that day about how these aides had not only taken such incredible care of my dad, but they took care of me. And having their presence allowed me to continue to live meaningful life. Now, this could look different for everyone in this room. I didn't have very much family around. My mother died suddenly one year into this journey. My brother was not present for most of this. So maybe you don't need a team of aides like this, but I do encourage you to think about who's gonna be your team. It can't just be yourself. And finally, I wanna acknowledge that your five senses are your best friends, that we can connect to meaning through what we see and touch and taste, and smell and hear, through love, through a tight handhold, through visions of beauty, and even through humor, we can feel connected to one another and we can feel connected to something greater than ourselves. Now, this was easy for me. I had such a warm relationship with my dad, but if you don't, this is still accessible to you. You can connect to meaning through your five senses simply by leaving the hospital and feeling the sunshine on your skin, or going to the hospital cafeteria and getting a cup of your favorite tea that you drank as a child, closing your eyes and thinking back and connecting to your inner child or putting your earbuds in and listening to your favorite piece of music and allowing yourself to get transported to a different time and place. We can, through our five senses, experience meaning, even in some of the most challenging circumstances. Many caregivers come to me and they say to me that they want to be able to help their care partner experience a bucket list item. And I wanna end by saying that I think that bucket lists are great. I think goals are wonderful. My dad had that goal to get to the Jersey Shore and he did. But every day of caregiving gives us the opportunity for a different type of bucket list item. Another elephant in the room, one final one for today, is that caregiving gives us endless opportunities to practice saying goodbye. Every time we say goodnight to our care partner, it's an opportunity to practice saying goodbye. Every time we leave the hospital, it's an opportunity to practice saying goodbye. Every time our care partner is taken for a medical exam, we practice saying goodbye. And as a result, we develop and strengthen our capacity to live more mindfully and fully and vulnerably and meaningfully. And for that, I remain so very grateful to caregiving. Thank you so much.